it, the CrossFit uh, definition for folks who you know are, are out there learning about it. Yes. So the second round is regionals. Yes. But the third round is the CrossFit Games. That's where they crown the fittest on the earth. Yes. yes. And so you have to be top what in regionals to make it to CrossFit so Games there's time? Eight, there was eight regionals. So the 16 regions, two regions fed into each regional at the time. And the top five men and women advanced and the top five teams advanced. Four to 5,000 people at a minimum are competing to enter regionals. For and then at one the half, end for of, one the half of the spots, for one half of the spots right. of regionals, and then Southern California is vying for the other half of the spots, and that was the California region at the time. And I'm on the same page yeah. here. So, only five teams and five people from that region make it to the CrossFit Games. So you guys can start to get an understanding. We're talking less than one percent of the people who enter even get a chance to make it to regionals, and less than that actually make it to the CrossFit Games. So you got to train with a guy who actually won the individual male at the CrossFit Games in 2015, Ben yeah. Smith. Yeah, him and his brothers came to the gym for a day. So, I mean, uh, wild. So there's a lot of fitness that's wrapped up in that, okay? Yeah. And so I think a lot of the challenges that some folks have that they might be able to pull some benefit from your journey and your experiences. So you, you get down this path and you start doing competitive CrossFit but what do you sort of fall in love with along the way? Because you started coaching, you started developing a reputation for yourself. And, so I did, I did and what are the what are those pillars mm -hmm. of fitness that help fifth grade you yeah. get started for the first time? That help taking a year off, getting shunned by you know a, 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 an attractive female who you're like, oh man, that sucks. You know, <laughs> staying motivated to do that, and then you know, what are the pieces of the pillar that have allowed you to the last 20 years be able to maintain this and sustain this because i think that's a struggle that a lot of people have so i know i packed in like three questions there but yeah let me kind of take you through the rest of the journey so i talked to you about everything up to about 2015 so 2016 i qualified in the team to go to regionals i just had a really good year in the open uh there were the people that i was training with it wasn't just the six people that went on the floor there was a couple other people that were part of that team effort and so uh we I think we qualified in sixth in the region out of 15. Like, we didn't do a bad job. It was, uh, I remember Mark Bell, he had talked to Ben. He's like, oh, yeah, your team qualified with you, but, like, are they still going to be there without you? And Ben's like, no, they qualified without me. He was like, oh, that's impressive. So, because he knows how much it takes. I mean, Mark Bell is a, like, he's a pretty renowned guy in the fitness industry and the powerlifting world. So, go to regionals. And then um, at the end of that year, I moved to Colorado. So, I scouted out a gym. Uh, they'd sent two teams to regionals for four years straight, a team of the games, one of those teams to the games for four years straight. I'm like, this is the place. I get there and it's like the mecca of CrossFit. Dude, 600 member gym, massive warehouse. There's 20 rings hanging and they have five full-time coaching staff. I'm like, I just walked into this place and I'm not the third person in the gym anymore. I'm like the ninth person in the gym. So I just walked into a place where I then have to continue to you know elevate myself. And so I got to train with a bunch of really good people there and unbeknownst to um, most CrossFit gyms, I think we had two really good females to every one male. That's an anomaly in CrossFit. So our females, we actually had more good females than we did men. Um, there's no knock on the guys. The guys were good, but the women were better. And we had more of them. So, uh, and, and some of these are like, you know, uh, NCAA women's national champion for swimming was one of the athletes there. Uh, some of them were a couple women that were in their late 30s and early 40s. Uh, I mean, just some general badasses. So I was there for about two years. That was about the peak of my competition career. I went to the Granite Games one time, which is in uh, Minnesota. And then I went again the next year and competed in a team of three pro division. That was 2018. Moved back to California. Uh, I didn't go to regionals when I was there at all. Um Probably would have went in 2017, but the gym messed up the team structures. Uh, they had seven guys on the primary team because that was a team that kept going to the games. And so everybody that wanted a shot, well, I put my name in the other hat because I'm like, I want to go to regionals and get that experience again. Give me any one of the guys that were on that team that were trying to go to regionals on the team that went to the and games. put them on your team and you guys would have made it. And we would have made it. It was the most frustrating thing in the world. Um, so anyway... 2018, compete in the pro division. You know, I'm I'm out at the Grand Games, competing with guys that are at the games themselves. Uh, it's 
pretty wild. To, you get out there for the first time and, you know, you throw down with them. And, and I actually did a lot better than I thought I would. And then I there's a couple of workouts, like, we just slayed it. And then there's one workout we just absolutely got fucking annihilated. <laughs> but uh, came back to California, went to the gym here that you were going to. It's not really the gym that I wanted to go to. I, I was kind of trying to find myself because I really loved my move to Colorado and the training and the people that I was around. And I felt like the floor got ripped out from underneath me. And so anybody who's on a fitness journey, you're going to hit these highs and lows of your journey. That was like a really low in my journey. And I didn't really know how to reestablish myself. I didn't know if I wanted to compete anymore. Like I didn't have the people around me. I didn't want to drive back out to Sacramento because I was going to college at the time. And that's the only reason why I wanted to drive an hour to train. You know, it's 30 minutes there, 30 minutes back. And so kept kept training, but I didn't necessarily have the fire that I had. COVID hits. Um, and uh, I'm sorry, I skipped over a very important step. While I was going through that phase, the local gym owner, he actually paid for me to go get my CrossFit cert. So mind you, I've competed at an elite level or what's basically considered like the pro level. Um, not saying that I was and the not best. in bodybuilding, but in CrossFit, in CrossFit, which yeah. is a big difference. I mean, it's the elite level. Yeah. Yeah. So um, he asked and, and I've been around. A, I, I kind of glazed over some of the coaching staff that I got to be around in Colorado. And I kind of gave you a little uh, insight into what I got pre Colorado uh, and he wanted me to be a coach and I had a ton of insight and knowledge and practical experience. I mean, 10 uh, hundreds of hours of like actual pr in practice experience. I go and I get my cert, start coaching classes. I think it's two or three weeks in the classes. My classes are at 40 people. This had a 200 member gym max. I mean, actually not even 200 members, 160. So 25% of the, the gym is coming to my classes on Mondays and Wednesdays. And I didn't realize it at the time, but basically I took my training approach to the way I ran a class. And it was really cool to coach that class for two years and see majority of it was like 40 to 60 year old people. I saw the progression of those people. Their mobility got better. Their posture was better. They felt better. They were more fit. And it was the approach that I had taken from my training. And I got to see this thing shine through and work for those people. Um, COVID hits 2020. I stopped coaching just because I'm not in love with it. Kind of ruined my relationship with the gym because I felt like I was always at the gym, but I wasn't working out. <laughs> so uh, I switched gyms to a gym that opened up here in town, and I'm glad I did. That's where I'm still at because a bunch of my friends went over there, and CrossFit's really a big community thing. And so I wanted to be around my community and some of the fellow fire breathers and just the people that are just generally go-getters. Okay. So no. he wanted me to coach there, and I ended up not coaching just because I I realized that it wasn't necessarily for me. And so, but that's you where started I've been. doing the programming for the gym. And for those people yes. who don't know, programming is where you're actually the person responsible for putting workouts together. Correct. That are on a weekly basis: so Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and one on Saturday. And there's a lot of relationship between the workouts because they work on either complementary muscle groups or they work on different combinations of strength training or high intensity uh, interval groups um, or different types of structural endurance. Thank all you. Kinds of things. Yeah. Not that educated in this. So appreciate you, you know, hopping in there, bike riding, rowing, swimming, running. Yeah. And yeah. so uh, a healthy combination that builds strength, but doesn't overwork you. Right. And that's Correct. a very, very big deal at CrossFit gyms because you really, you're going there for, because it's group fitness. Yeah. You know, you obviously went there to compete at a certain period of time. But most folks who go to CrossFit, they're doing it for, you know, A, their health, but B, it's a lot of mental discipline and a lot of mental training. And it makes you, um, you know, uh, get better mm -hmm. under intense conditions. And that's one of the things I love about CrossFit. But you were the one putting together all of that programming, which is incredibly important because now you've got all this professional experience. You know, you've ran the journey in through your 20s. But now yeah. what do you learn in your late twenties, early thirties, as you start programming for that gym. So yeah, that was a, a, I'm glad that you really know me too, cause you're able to help guide a little bit of this conversation. That was a very key inflection and turning point. So I had to then take what I was doing for classes, right? Cause I, I was essentially coaching a quarter of the gym at a CrossFit gym here in town. And then I switched to the other one. <coughs> Sorry. The guy here in town, he knew who I was. He like I, I'm not a like a super popular person, but there's a lot of people at the time that knew me, 
in the area. And he's yeah, like, if you're in the CrossFit community, you know people in the community. Exactly. So he's like, hey, man, I want you to coach here. And I'm like, hey, you know what? It's not for me. I've ran a couple classes for him, just kind of ad hoc when you need somebody to cover. But I actually worked with him to develop his coaches. So on a Saturday, one Saturday every month for like half a year, a year, I was helping develop his coaching staff. And at the same time, I was running the programming. And so what I walked them through is I was like, hey, this is the methodology for the programming. What's the intent of the workout? What's the approach that everybody should take? What is their mindset that they should have while they're doing the workout? And those are my pillars of my programming. My programming would span over the course of the month. I'd have a, a, or a month or two months, whatever the cycle was, and then I'd break it down by day and by week. And, have and let's also address in there too that there is what we call in CrossFit an RX program, which is basically as prescribed, RX, uh -huh, pharmacy. And then there is the second piece of that, which is a scaled piece. Now, I think a lot of people out there are scared of CrossFit. Um, they think it's intense. They think it's, you know, uh, for people who are ex-college athletes or ex-high school athletes. And the reality is it's really for everybody. And that scaled um Workout is basically an on-ramp to be able to do the RX programming, right? So not only mm -hmm. are you having to do the RX programming, but you're also having to, for the same workout, having to do the scaled programs because we have, at least at the CrossFit gym we go to, we have a pretty diverse group of people, backgrounds, genders, et cetera, mm -hmm. um, all varying levels of athleticism, right? And so it's important. Levels. Yes. Because in the classes, there's a combination of anybody and everybody. Yeah, so programming is the backbone. It's the lifeblood of a gym. Uh, I had to account for everything. The amount of equipment we had, the gym space was actually really small when the owner had since moved, and I had known that at the time. But part of my job was getting 20 people in a space that was really only meant for 10 and using the equipment we had and getting people a good experience. So not only was I solving the programming problem of making sure that everybody got a workout and that you could scale the workout, but the equipment was used efficiently, the space was used efficiently, and I was giving everybody a wide range of workouts across a broad spectrum of different fitness modalities. And so translation, you're never doing the same workout every day or it doesn't feel that way. So I did that for a year and a half for him, and then we moved to his other space. We had He had went to a, a different programming that's online that uh, is ran by a big gym out of Tennessee that a lot of gyms follow, and it's cost-effective. So... And also, to be honest, it wasn't as good. You didn't have the time, right? And I that's, didn't have the that's time. That's the other thing. Yeah. So let's let's talk yeah. about. So you you program for a couple of years. You're doing that now along the way, and I, I think this is the point that I really want to get into because as we talk about some practical tips, you know, towards the middle the end of this podcast, along the way, you're having to figure out nutrition. You're having to figure out. There's a lot of things. Your health. You're having to figure out your mobility. So. So let's obviously we talked about your background, your experience. You're you're very well rounded, very well versed in the world of fitness. But to be healthy, you don't always have to be in the gym. The gym is a way to be healthy, but there's also other tracks of being healthy that you need to do in tandem to then also be healthy at the gym. So let's talk about so some of those. If I could just knowledge bomb everybody with 15 years of experience, if you're going to start in the gym, here's my number one recommendation. The gym is one hour of your day, or maybe two, if you're really getting it. What are you doing for the other 23 hours of your day? You're, when you're in the gym, if you have not prepared to be in the gym, you're not going to get the results. You're not going to feel good while you're there because you're not going to have the energy. Okay. You're, if you're not eating the proper foods and taking care of yourself and giving yourself enough nutrition, you're not going to have the energy. And if you're not sleeping, like everything's, everything's bad. The mental tenacity, because you've been sleeping and you've been taking care of your body and you're not tired, to stay on top of the workout. Because working out is very mental. It's one of the most mental things that I've ever done when you competed at an extremely high level. You have to be mentally aware of everything you're doing the entire time you're working out. Because yeah. if you're not, you're going to get hurt. You're going to lose. You're going to you're going to fall behind. Something bad's going to happen. And, and let's give some context here really quickly. So a workout could be something like... You have to do three rope climbs, then you have to run 200 meters, and then after you run 200 meters, you could do eight, you know, deadlifts with 225 pounds, 
and then a hundred pull ups, and, and then, then do eight again, and, and then, then go yeah, back. and then yeah. twenty pull ups. So to and then let's say you got to do that four times, and your score is how long it takes you to do it, right? Lowest time wins. So now we put that into context for people. Now continue when you talk about energy. So that's just being able to have your mind right. So you need to be able to sleep. Well, sleep is also what's responsible for helping your body recover. So your body feels refreshed. So anybody who's worked out for, you know, four days in a row knows that on day one, you feel a lot better than you do on day four because your body's fatigued. Sleep is one of the mechanisms that's going to help your body recover. Nutrition is another one of those mechanisms. So if you didn't eat enough during the day or you didn't feel yourself well enough the day before and you go to the gym in the morning, you're going to feel it. You're not going to have energy because you need to eat food to move. That's, we all expense, our caloric intake is your baseline calories that you need to support your biology without movement. It's just your daily function of your heart beating, your lungs going, et cetera. Once you add movement in there, that adds on top of it. Food is how we give ourselves energy to do those things. So if you're not sleeping and you're not eating, it's not the right foods at this point, but if you're not eating, you're not prepared, Okay. So, and hydration is another one of those things I'll just lightly group into eating, even though it's not really the right category for it. So that's being prepared to be in the gym. All right. That's what is more important. I would rather somebody be prepared before they go into the gym and go to the gym four days a week than be unprepared and go to the gym six days a week. Because the person that's going to be prepared, when they're at the gym, they're going to enjoy it more. When they get done with their workouts, they're going to feel better. They're not going to hate their experience in the gym. And when they're not at the gym, their body's going to be recovering. So they're going to be getting ready to do the next workout. That's sustainable. And it's going to produce results better because the stress hormones in the body, the bad stress hormones, they're going to be able to keep those in check. So that's just, you know, being prepared for the gym. Once you're in the gym, there's a couple of other things that contribute to your ability to uh, basically develop your body. And that's your body's, uh, getting your body to have good adaptations uh, to the physical resp- the physical loads and forces that you're putting on your body and how well it's going to recognize that, oh, hey, I need to help my body become better and put on more muscle, be able to do these things that, that the brain is asking the body to do. Okay, so let's talk about that a little bit. You said, you know, being prepared for with sleep. Is there any tools or things that you like to use that help you track your sleep or your recovery, stuff like that? Yeah, so I I haven't been wearing it recently, but I used to wear a whoop pretty religiously for four years. What's a whoop? A whoop is a wearable strap that you have on your wrist. Uh, you don't really ever have to take it off, but a, a whoop's going to track your sleep. It's going to track, uh, which which re- correlates to your recovery. It gives you a score out of 100. It's going to track your workouts. Basically, what it's doing is it's tracking your biometrics. Sorry, no, not your biometrics. It's tracking your essentially your cardiovascular system, and it's tracking that over time. So, and, uh, a, a great tool for you know people to learn how to sleep. And I think this is a really good point. Some people are going to say they feel well rested on four hours of sleep. Some people are going to say they need eight or nine hours of sleep per night. Everybody's body's different. Um, what that really and comes down loop to, strap, I think, gives you a good tool to figure that out because it, it does. It determines, from my understanding it takes your heart rate and the variances between your low heart rate and your high heart rate. And the higher the variances are, um, usually the less stressed you are. But if you have a low variance between your resting heart rate and your highest heart rate for the day, then they know that you're usually not as well recovered, right? Because your resting heart rate could either be... If your resting heart rate's elevated, that's usually an indicator that the body's been under a lot of stress and it hasn't had the ample time to recover yet. So what's really good about the WHOOP data is... It's aggregating your data over time. So it's got all of your last week's worth of data. I've had days where I've only slept like five hours because I just got jolted and I woke up or I only like I had to catch a plane or something. And it's like, hey, you're 78% recovered. But what my whoop strap knows is what did I do the, for the last five days? Okay, well, you were way primed to go and do some really you know heavy physical exertion, but you didn't. And then you got five hours of sleep. So you're still pretty primed. And you could use the tool, you could use the whoop strap as a tool to understand, hey, how hard should I be going in the gym today? And I talked a lot about, I picked this up when I was in Colorado, but I since talked about about green, yellow, and red light days. 
and I used my Whoopstrap to help me understand those things.